especially the coated ones. You should do it before you use it the first time and every time you get ready to cook because it helps the nonstick properties of the pan. And it's just something that I've gotten in the habit of doing whether I'm using the nonstick versions of Kinetic Cookware or whether I'm using stainless steel. If I use the stainless steel, I still season it. It just helps the food not to stick as much as it normally would. Another thing that I like to do is to use veggie spray not only on my vegetables and fruits and then wash it off but I also use it on the counters or cutting boards where food can come in contact as well. Let's get started with our recipes. Without a doubt I've gotten the most compliments on this next meal. That's right tuna stuffed peppers. This is a good time to pause your DVD player and write down the ingredients for your recipe card. As you can see, the ingredients are really not that many, but boy, what a meal this makes. And you have a lot of options depending upon your palate and your taste. The first thing I do is choose my peppers, and I fit them into the pan. So I'm going to make exactly the number of peppers that fit into the pan that you see here. We're going to be using that in the oven when it comes time. And I like to have, of course, my oil nearby. I like to have mushrooms. If you don't like them, leave them out. Onions, choose the one you like. I happen to like Spanish, I like white, and scallions. Vidalia are good, too. Three cans of tuna, two or three cups of rice, a pint of sour cream, celery if you want it, and, well, one of my favorites indeed is tomato. Okay, what you want to do is cut the heads off those peppers and simply clean out all of the seeds, put them into one container, and uh, you can cut off the tops too so we don't waste any food. If you decide that you want to grow some of those peppers, which you can do, it's really kind of fun, uh, just dry them out for a while and then plant them and see what comes up. That's what I have done and I've actually gotten some good peppers out of it. Now take your peppers and cut them into smaller bite-sized pieces, uh, somewhat even so that they cook evenly when we get to the stage where we're going to be cooking them. Always keep your fingers away from that sharp blade. As I said before, I'm not a chef, I'm a cook. And uh, there's a difference. I don't have all the real techniques down, but I am careful. Now, if you like celery, slice it kind of thin, small pieces. I happen to like the flavor of celery when it's cooked. If you don't care for celery, it's not going to hurt the recipe, not one bit. The next thing, mushrooms. You can choose any kind of mushrooms. Uh, I chop them into very small pieces. I happen to like the consistency of a mushroom, but once again, if you don't like mushrooms, it's okay. It's not going to affect the overall taste of the recipe. It just adds a little bit more texture. And of course, slice up your onion and cut those onion pieces into smaller bite-sized pieces as well. 
See how that onion fell on the counter there? No problem. That's why I use the veggie spray. Okay, here we go. We put them all together in one little container. Next, take a pot of boiling water. Take the peppers that we have cut and taken the heads off of and put them into the boiling water. Do not overcook them. Boil them for three to four minutes at the most. That's all you have to do. You don't want to overcook the peppers. This is just to get them started. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to put some oil into the already seasoned fry pan. We're going to set the heat, of course, on medium. See, I, I season my pans a lot. It really does help the nonstick capability. So if you haven't seasoned it, season it now. And go ahead and put some more oil into the pan. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the... Uh, and by the way, this is an important part of this program. I always talk about this part of it. Uh, be careful around the heat. What you want to do is put your peppers, your onions, the cut up mushrooms, and celery. Put a little oil on the top of that as well and set your heat at medium. That's all you have to do. Remember, you don't want to set it on high. You don't need to. Now you can add a few little spices if you want to. A little basil if you like that kind of flavoring. I put a little parsley on there. It kind of looks neat. Sometimes I add a little tiny bit of garlic salt to it as well. Take the peppers that have been boiling for only about four minutes out and put them into that pan that we had fit them into before. Remember in the beginning we put them into the pan so they fit? That's why. You have a perfect fit and the peppers all stand up. Always be careful around hot water. Yeah, nice, colorful laid out beautifully. Now we have been uh, frying in oil our cut up pieces of pepper as well as the onions, the mushrooms, and the celery. Wish we had smell of vision It smells so good here. Okay, now into any mixing bowl, take your pint of sour cream, pour it in, and dump in the cans of tuna. Take the whole pint, put it in there, dump in the cans of tuna and take the fried veggies, the peppers and the onions, the celery and the mushrooms and put it right on top of the tuna and the sour cream. You notice there's almost nothing stuck there. In fact, there is nothing stuck there to the pan whatsoever. And stir those up good. Don't worry about the sour cream getting warm. The whole idea is to get those vegetables in there. And then pour in the rice. If you want them creamy, use two cups. If you want them a little bit thicker with ice, use three cups. What kind of rice? Well, the best is some kind of an instant rice. It's normally like a 10-minute cook. That's what I use. I don't use uh, rices that take too long to cook, like the 30-minute versions and so forth. And then mix all of that up into a nice, even batter. That's a nice consistency. If you want it a little thicker, as I sometimes do, I'll put a little bit more rice in. By the way, the music that we've got going on here in the background is something that I do just to relax you as you're cooking. It's music that uh, comes from a variety of sources, including most of it, my own music, and uh, a few other favorites that I have permission to use. Stir it up good so that there's an even consistency, and you're done with that part. Now, take a spoon and scoop out the entire mix and put it right into the peppers. That's tuna, rice, sour cream, peppers, onions, celery, mushrooms. Now, it's interesting that I don't do a lot of measuring. I really don't. I just kind of fill things up, and uh, I like to fill up the peppers right to the top. They are going to swell up a little bit, so I kind of flatten them out over the top. Pack them good. Perfectly fit into that pan. And if you have extra, get a small dish that you can use in the oven, like you see here, and pack it 
with the filling. Maybe there are some people who would love to have the tuna mix with rice and don't like the taste of peppers. No problem. This is going to give that person the ability to enjoy the meal along with you. I personally love the stuffed pepper mix with everything, but there are some people that simply don't like them or maybe they're allergic. So this gives you another alternative to use the recipe for. In fact, you can make the recipe completely without peppers if that's the kind of a person you are. The tastes are all going to blend. Make them flat. Good shape there. I love the flavor of this. I just, I just do. In fact, oh, you caught me. Sorry. You know, you ever hear about licking the bowl? Well, that's what I do sometimes, and I can't help it. That's me. I love cooking. What can you say? Delicious. All right. The next thing you do is you slice a couple of uh, lemons just into some nice little cuts like this, and uh, do the same thing with tomato, and stick the tomato or the lemon right on the top of the peppers. Just a little added difference. Those with the lemon will require some of the lemon flavor. Those with the tomato is just kind of a nice garnish that I love to use. And uh, this is another idea too that actually helps the peppers taste really good is to squeeze any extra lemon over the top. Preheat your oven to 325 degrees and bake for only 50 minutes. Make sure you always use gloves that are heat resistant. Your cooking gloves, very important, and especially when you remove anything from the oven. When they're done, you will not only have some beautifully baked, oh, they are beautiful. I, I, I'm drooling here. Baked tuna stuffed peppers ready to go. Notice the two heat gloves are on. And you have those two little casserole dishes that I had with some extras there you can serve separately and uh, they do not come out dry. I covered those. I didn't cover the peppers. You can if you want to, but they usually come out very moist regardless. And there you go. What a beautiful display and what a beautiful meal for anyone who loves anything to do with tuna, rice, and stuffed peppers. Kids love it when you put it in a small bowl, and that's right, beautiful for a picnic. Just heat them up, take them out. They'll still be warm. Some people even eat them cold. And uh, like a tuna sandwich is called, same idea. And uh, add some potato chips and you're off and running. The Portuguese vinegar roast featuring chicken is one of the best meals I have ever had. You get tomato sauce in it and you've got some cider vinegar, a couple of links of charisse, you've got the chicken of course, potatoes, carrots, turnips, maybe two to three onions, salt and pepper. Make sure that you have frozen that recipe down. Take a look here. It's very simple. Chicken, tomato sauce, turnip if you want it, carrot if you want it, onions, and charisse. Charisse is Portuguese sausage. Not available everywhere, but boy, it does make a difference. You can use chorizos if you need to. First thing I do, of course, is to season the pan. Make sure you always pause, by the way, the program on any of the ingredients so you can write them down and gather them up before you continue. Choose your favorite ones, and you'll be able to take a look at those recipes whenever you need to. Next, pour in the tomato sauce. Now, I use anywhere from 28 ounces to 38 ounces or 40 ounces. I use a can or two, but certainly the can, and then I add a full cup or cup and a half of water. This is going to provide the base for our broth. The next part's important because it helps the meat break down and the vegetables break down so that they are all tender. Put anywhere from really a quarter of a cup is best in a pan this size. Just a quarter of a cup, a little bit of cider vinegar, and put it right into the sauce. No need to mix yet. My mouth is watering already because I love this kind of food. A little bit of pepper right on the top there. And if you like salt, put a little bit of salt on there. Kosher salt if you've got it. Just a little bit. Next, stir it lightly. So it doesn't splatter all over the place. Just try to get the pepper and the vinegar in particular mixed in 
with the water and the tomato sauce, just so it is somewhat consistent. Remember, you can pause this program in between the steps if you want to cook right along with me. A lot of people do that. They do each step, they watch it, and then they do it. The next thing that we want to do is we're going to put in our chicken. It's already been washed, as you should always do with poultry. Wash it good. And here is the nice part for me. It's kind of decorating. I take cut up potatoes, a turnip, and onion and carrot. And I put it all around the chicken. Notice the chicken is somewhat submerged, so some of that sauce is going on to the inside of the chicken as well. And we're putting the vegetables right in around the chicken and the sauce. One of the beauties about this particular meal is the fact that you get to cook everything together. It all comes out beautifully cooked all together. And it's in one pan that you can serve from. So here's a pan that you're setting it up in, you're going to bake in, and you can put it on a trivet or on the table, and you can serve and cut directly from there, and people can choose which of the vegetables they like. If they don't like tuna, they don't take it. If they like more potato, they can take extra. Makes it real nice. Now, the charisse. This is the time when the charisse comes in. There's more flavoring in this charisse than you can possibly imagine. Cut your charisse into chunks like this. I actually prefer the charisse, and if you don't have it, use linguiça or some kind of a kielbasa if you want to. It's not really Portuguese at that point. The chorizo is usually are wrapped, and they break apart a little bit too much for slicing like this. Put the charisse, or the type of sausage that you're using, all over the roast. I put it there between the, the drumsticks and the thigh area. I put it in right with the vegetables. The reason is because, especially with charisse, what happens is the juices from the meat will flow into the sauce, onto the vegetables, and into the chicken. It looks beautiful. It tastes unbelievable. And this is a real traditional Portuguese meal. Then I take a baster, and I take that sauce, and I cover the chicken and even some of the vegetables. The reason you don't want any more sauce than about a half of a pan is because you don't want the chicken boiling in it. We're using it as a flavoring and as a base, and we want the vegetables to roast. We don't want them to be boiled. Basting like this is really, really good because of the blending of the flavors, and that's what I love about this roast. It's the blend of all the different foods. Also. One of the things that I think you'll find very interesting is uh, the way that we cook this. We're going to cover it up and we're going to put it into the oven. And uh, we're going to set it at 325 degrees for an hour and a half. But at the hour and a half mark, you baste it again. You take it out and you cover it again with the sauce using your baster. Be careful. Use your cooking pads. Make sure you don't get burned. An hour and a half the first time. Take it out. Baste it again completely. Put it back in the oven for another hour. Check your vegetables. If they're not quite done, or if they're too firm for you, put it in for another half hour. You won't overcook the chicken because of the moisture from the sauce. You can see how beautiful that looks going into the oven. When you do take it out of the oven, it looks absolutely fantastic. Steaming hot and absolutely delicious. Make sure your vegetables are not too firm because you have to put it back again. And then use your baster. Use your baster to pull out some of that sauce so that other people, when they serve themselves at the table, don't splatter all over the place. And what they can end up doing is they can actually uh, take that sauce and use it as a gravy for extra. The other thing that I do, honestly, is uh, when I serve this, sometimes what I do is I will remove the vegetables and the chicken and lay it out into some kind of a, a serving pan of some sort. And I take the extra sauce... The extra sauce goes into a separate container that I can store later on for use with soups and other flavorings. It is a fantastic base for soups because of all the vegetables and the meat. There's your Portuguese chicken roast. Delicious. Enjoy. One of the most popular foods I ever served my kids 
hot dog stew. I know it sounds funny. You're going to laugh. Pause the program right here and write down these ingredients, which include some hot dogs, some regular-sized franks or large ones, some peppers, some onions. And uh, we're going to either have rice, pasta, or potatoes, depending on your family's desire. You actually have the ability to put the hot dog stew over pasta, rice, or my favorite, which is mashed potatoes. Three differently colored peppers is always really nice, and you can add celery to it if you want to as well, as the ingredients show. You know, this program does move along fairly quickly. That's so we could get as many recipes into the program as possible for you. And what we do is we take a large pot, and uh, we're showing you here that uh, we've already pre-cooked the pasta. It's just cooled off. It's already been cooked. I'm using the little wagon wheels there. I happen to like that. Uh, I also cooked uh, the mashed potatoes a little bit beforehand, put a little basil on the top so it looks kind of pretty. And um, that's my favorite, mashed potatoes. You want to chop up all of the vegetables, the onions, the peppers, the celery, and uh, the hot dogs, and have them all set to go. Now what I do is I season the pan. I always season the pan. And you'll notice here I'm using my hands, but my hands are clean. And I wash them off. And sometimes I like to get my hands right into the pot, as they say, and I don't use the paper towel at all. Next thing that I like to do is, uh, this almost looks beautiful the way that it is. Uh, you take your hot dogs. Remember, you can use either three or four of the big jumbo ones or uh, a package of the uh, smaller hot dogs. I use a combination of both. The large ones puff up to the size of a dollar and the small ones puff up to the size of a quarter. And the kids have different sizes there and it doesn't really affect the taste. Next thing I do, take a can of tomato sauce, dump it right in on top of the hot dogs. I use one smaller can of diced tomatoes, 14 ounces or whatever they come in uh, on top of that. And then I put in about, uh, about a cup of water. A tiny bit of pepper. If the kids don't like pepper, don't use it. If the kids don't like salt, don't use it. I happen to like just a little bit of each just to bring out the flavor in the uh, tomatoes in the mix with the hot dogs. There you go, there's your sauce. There's your basic sauce. And I like to stir that good. Now the reason I like to prepare it this way is to let the hot dogs kind of soak up the sauce as well. So they are sitting in the cold sauce right now, just stirred up and uh, staying moist. Next, I take one of the larger fry pans and put it on the stove. And as I do as a repeated habit, can't emphasize enough how good this is for your cookware, making it last, and also for your general cooking. Just uh, put some oil on the pan, and then put a little bit more oil into the pan itself. Always set your heat on medium. What we're going to be doing is preparing that pan so that we can just braise a little bit, lightly cook the mixed vegetables that we cut up. Now remember, you know, you can leave things out. The kids don't like onions, don't put them in. The celery is a good substitute to have the consistency you want, or vice versa. You can add a little bit of garlic to it, too, if you like. That's my style of doing it for adults. Kids generally like food that is not too overly spiced. Now I'm going to put a little bit more oil on top of the components peppers, different colors, celery, onion, and uh, stir it up a little bit. I'm going to get that on the medium heat, of course, and uh, I'm going to let it cook a little bit. Let's put a cover on it. We have the first part of our hot dog stew ready to roll. It actually cooks much faster than you think. Next, take the pot, put it on the stove and uh, stir up your vegetables. Don't burn them. It's hard to burn things if you keep the heat at the medium level, as I said before. I, I happen to uh, cook these just right, just right. They just started to cook, and then pour them in to the pot with the hot dog stew mix, the tomato sauce and the hot dogs and the onions and the celery, and everything's going to blend all in together here and just be a, a wonderful, wonderful sauce. I'm going to show you again. Look at that. <laughs> Nothing sticks. Wonderful. And I turn off the front burner that I was cooking those on. And here we are just stirring away. You stir the, the 
food in so that everything mixes up. The sauces cover everything, as you can see it here. It uh, looks good. And I know some people laugh. They say, hot dogs, too. Well, you got to be out of your mind. What a crazy meal that sounds like. I haven't had one person, not ever, tell me, wow, this is really good, especially if you're a hot dog lover in any way. Use quality beef hot dogs, of course. That's what I use. Unless you uh, don't like beef, I suppose you can substitute for the chicken franks, but I, I like good quality beef hot dogs. You can uh, add a little bit more pepper on the top of this if you like to uh, season it up a little bit. Some people will put in a little basil or even a bay leaf for a little extra flavor, and then cover it. Next, set your heat on medium and leave it on the stove. When it's just about at a boiling point, take it off. And here is how you serve it. Right over the mashed potatoes. I like to take my mashed potatoes, make a little ring, and a little hole there in the middle. Uh, same thing with the pasta. This is an unbelievable meal. What a comfort food this is for the winter. And you can serve it with a couple of, I like, Portuguese rolls, which are sweet bread rolls. Or if you don't have them, you can get Hawaiian rolls. And that's all you need to serve a fantastic, delicious, comforting food you and your family. Hot dog stew, one of my favorites. Try it. You'll love it. Red kidney bean soup. A can of red kidney beans, a can of tomato sauce, a cup of chopped onion, three to four cut up potatoes, a little bit of water, one to two cups, and some salt and pepper. You can have this meal together in about 15 minutes. It is a wonderful meal, especially for seniors that do not eat a lot. You want to get some really good value out of the beans, of course, because everyone knows that they're good for you. And you say beans and potatoes? That doesn't make any sense. Well, the way that this is blended together with the tomato sauce uh, and the onions and the beans makes a very healthy meal. Uh, I put in the potatoes and... Uh, Put in the onions on top, so we have the tomato sauce first, throw in the kidney beans, throw in the uh, potatoes and the onions, and put a little bit of pepper and salt on it if you like. I also add uh, at least a cup of water sometimes too, depending on whether you want the soup thick or a little bit thinner. A little bit more salt. I like to do it in layers. I don't put a lot ever. I just put little layers in there and then mix it up good. Again, this is one of those foods you could come home on an hour lunch break, make it, eat it, and go back to work without a problem because it is so fast. The blend of the food makes it really a comfort food. That's what I call it. It's a real nice comfort food. Kidney bean soup using red beans. Put it on the oven and uh, put it on the appropriate size burner. Put it on medium again or a little bit less if you want to. Medium kind of works good because the beans are already cooked in most of the cans that are out there. These are red kidney beans from a can and everything else just needs to kind of uh, blend. The way I serve it, with a nice croissant roll, or Hawaiian roll, or Portuguese sweetbread if you can find it, put it into a small bowl, ideal for uh, an adult, a uh, senior in particular, or for kids for a quick lunch and great comfort food. I've got a tip for you. Yeah, kids sometimes have a hard time remembering how to set up the silverware. I've got one that's gonna help you. The word fork, F-O-R-K, has four letters, so does L-E-F-T. R-I-G-H-T, five letters, so does spoon and so does knife. So the fork goes on the left, the spoon and the knife on the right. Just a quick tip for fun. Chicken cutlets can be really delicious if they're prepared correctly, and the first part of preparation is to wash that chicken thoroughly. I am a maniac for this. There are several reasons. I don't know how long it has been sitting in the store, in the juices, where it was stored before it got to the store. I don't care if the manufacturer tells you, clean, prepared, and ready to go. Wash them. I even use my veggie spray, anything, to make sure that I have cleaned them up. And frankly, the veggie spray helps to remove any of the, uh, the greasiness from the chicken. It's easier to handle. Wash it and rinse it thoroughly, always. It protects your family, and it makes the cutlets really a lot better. My favorite tool, the scissors. I love to use cooking shears to uh, trim all of the unwanted parts and membranes and some of the little fat pieces away. I like to have my uh, chicken cutlets kind of pristine. No 
veins of fat or membranes going through it. And what I do is I'll slice them into uh, small slices like this and sometimes find more of those little membranes and unwanted parts, I call them. Uh, chicken cutlets are probably the uh, cleanest of the chicken areas to cook with. Now, here's where people get confused and they mess up the chicken cutlets. The order is this. You have the chicken and then egg, flour, and breadcrumbs. Okay, chicken, egg, flour, and breadcrumbs. And what I sometimes do is put a little bit of salt into the egg and some seasoned salt, just a little bit, under the flour. And then I take some garlic and I, I put the breadcrumbs, I put some garlic because the uh, manufacturers that have the so-called seasoned breadcrumbs, I never taste it. So I put my own. I like to put a little bit of seasoning in that way uh, rather than uh, afterwards. The chicken goes to the egg, then goes to the flour, then the breadcrumbs. If you get the order correct, everything will come out great. If you mix it up, they come out crummy and just not right. This is going to come out delicious. So you take your chicken. It's been washed and it's not as uh, greasy because it's been washed thoroughly. You can even dry it if you want before you use it. All right, put it in the egg and then roll it in the flour. Cover chicken cutlet with egg completely and then the flour completely and then put it in the breadcrumbs and roll it around till the breadcrumbs stick and then move it to the back of uh, your cookware. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm moving it to the back of it and it kind of stiffens a little bit because everything kind of merges together and makes it a little easier to handle and doesn't become crummy. Alright, so once again, cover it with egg, put it into the flour, roll it so it's completely covered. into the breadcrumb, roll it so it's completely covered, and move it to the back away from the breadcrumbs. You see how I have them split? The breadcrumbs are pushed to one end of that uh, glassware and then I move it to the back the other. Same rules when you're making chicken cutlets. Don't burn them. Put it on medium. Take one of your kinetic fry pans and put a good dose of olive oil. Not so much so that you'll be covering up the cutlets, but so that they will uh, cook. Bring it so that it just starts to steam, and then put your cutlets in evenly around the pan. Don't put them one on top of the other. A little tiny space between them is fine, but uh, I know a lot of people try to squeeze as much into the pan as they possibly can. So just try to uh, leave a little bit of space and just let them sit there. Now, one of the beauties of the Kinetic Cookware is the fact that it cooks so evenly. Everything cooks at the same time the same way. It's not a few in the middle that get burned and the outer ones are not cooked. And I know you know what I mean. You can see how the oil in between them is cooking. And I cook them right to the point where they're turning from brown just to dark brown. That's how I know that they're going to be cooked thoroughly. I don't burn them, but I like my chicken cutlets done to the dark brown side. You can make them lighter if you like. That's how I do it. And you can see as I'm turning these over that, boy, they are really cooked pretty much the same way all the way across the board here, depending on how much breadcrumb, of course, you put on it. And move them around a little bit. Somehow this particular meal seems simple. A lot of people, they mess it up because of the egg, flour, and breadcrumb order. And uh, sometimes I will turn the heat down just a little bit. It doesn't always have to be on medium with the cookware because now the pan is already quite hot. And you can turn it down to medium low if you want. Look at that. Nothing burned. Light brown to dark brown. And I know that my chicken is being cooked thoroughly. You can serve cutlets with anything. You can serve it on sandwiches. Serve it with mashed potatoes. Look at that plate. It is ready to go. And they're great hot or cold. Chicken cutlets anytime. That was fast. It was easy and prepared correctly. Take the time to enjoy them with your family. They're great hot. They're great cold. They're great anytime. Swiss steak, a wonderful meal for beef lovers. And uh, pause your directions here if you want to, or your contents, your ingredients. Almost any kind of beef works. It's all going to get tender. I'm using London broil. You can use any good quality beef. Doesn't matter. A pepper, an onion, a couple of cans of tomato sauce. Uh, obviously, I've got some salt and pepper there. And most importantly is I have a bag of flour. I'll tell you what to do with that in just a moment. 
All right, first of all, you want to cut up your meat, make sure that it's all cleaned up and trimmed. And then what you want to do is take about a half to three quarters of a cup of flour, put it in a plastic bag, and throw all the meat into it. This is how you make Swiss steak because what it's going to do is it's going to let you braise the beef, it's going to help to make the sauce, and it's, it's important that you, you try it my way. You've got to put the beef, it's all cut up into little bite-sized pieces, into the bag, close the bag, leave some air in it, and then juggle it around. You'll find a little leftover piece there, no problem, we just pick it up and throw it back in again here, close it, and shuffle that thing around. Move it all over the place, any place you want. That's it, just shuffle it. Mix it all up. So it covers every piece of meat. Then what you want to do is you want to uh, season your pan, of course, and then put some extra oil into one fry pan. And what I'm doing here is I'm pulling the meat out, but leaving the excess flour in the bag. You don't want to dump the bag of extra flour into the pan. It'll come out too pasty. What you want to do is you just want to cover the meat, get all the little pieces out of there, and you'll see there's a little bit of flour left, but that's okay. The extra flour, toss it. You're done with it. Okay, the next step, I like to clean the breadboard. Cross-contamination is a problem when you're cooking for flavors as well as health reasons, so I... Uh, I washed it in the sink actually before I saw you, but then I also used my veggie spray on it again. I think it's a great idea to keep that veggie spray around. Just keep things nice and clean. Okay, now we're going to put some more oil on top of the beef that we have put into the fry pan. And we're going to take another fry pan, small one, and we're going to put into it with some oil, some cut up peppers, bite sized, not too small and some onions. The next part here is uh, where we really get the tender meat to take place because we're going to be both stovetop cooking and baking. What you do is you simply uh, on medium heat braise the beef. It's lightly cooked and dump it right into the pan, right at the bottom of the pan making sure that everything is I'm doing that I'm making sure that everything is indeed at least braised a little bit there you go nice move the uh, pot that you just poured in the braised beef over to uh, an unlighted burner and pour the juice from the braised beef right over the peppers and onions and move that pan to an appropriate burner as I told you before the correct size now what we're going to do is we're going to kind of braise that uh, peppers and the onions but remember we poured in the extra juice by the way look look at the pan that's the pan we had the beef in look how clean that is I mean, the coating really works if you season it correctly yeah, it's very important that you take the extra juice. When you put the uh, beef into the big pot, you take the extra juice and oil and you put it right into the uh, cooking of the vegetables, pepper and uh, the onions. And if you feel as though you want to add a little bit more oil to that, no problem. So you can see what we have here is we simply have the lower section of the pan is covered completely with the braised beef. Then we top the braised beef with the slightly cooked onions and peppers. You can put a little garlic in there too if you like it. Flatten it down a little bit with your spatula or your cooking spoon, whatever you're using. My slotted cooking spoon there. Pour in the tomato sauce right over the top. Then dice tomatoes over the top. So we've actually covered the meat and the vegetables with the sauce on the top. It will eat down as it cooks and cover. Now this next part is important. Put it in at 300 only into the oven. The total cook time, 
you can see here, it's not very long at all. Two hours at 300 degrees. That is why the meat is going to come out absolutely melting in your mouth, and that's why it doesn't matter as long as you've got a good quality beef, what you use. It will melt in your mouth because that slow cooking makes it very tender. You can serve it in a big bowl where people can help themselves to a smaller bowl with a croissant or sweet roll. Portuguese codfish or bacalhau. Portuguese codfish or bacalhau requires two pounds of codfish, a little bit of garlic, two cans of tomatoes, two cans of diced potatoes, some scallions or onions, a quarter of a cup of olive oil, some pepper, and uh, some people like to put boiled eggs on the top at the end. I personally don't, but you might be wanting to do that. And you can also add a cup of dry white wine if you like. But here's the basic recipe. The first thing to notice is that I do have two different kinds of codfish there. The one on the left, the three pieces, they're fresh. The one on the right is salted codfish. And the salted codfish has to be soaked overnight and drained several times. That's if you can't get the fresh codfish, you can usually find salted codfish in your grocery store's frozen fish section. Now, what we do is we uh, just get through spraying some olive oil into our pan and putting in some tomato sauce. Next, we pour in one can of the diced potatoes. And uh, we take our regular chopped onion and put that on top as well. The next part is important, and the reason is because I love the flavor of garlic and I like to put it in at this stage right here. Two little pieces of garlic, I squeezed it in there and then threw an open garlic piece right in there. It's unsqueezed using the garlic press. Next thing I do is I cut the codfish and it's important not to cut it too small. Cut it like two inches square or two by three inches. And the reason is because codfish breaks down during the cooking process and it breaks down into smaller bite-sized pieces beautifully. If you cut them too small in the beginning, then they break up too much. So I'll show you just now in a second just about the size that I like to have for the codfish. Again, I'm using fresh codfish. You can use salted, but you have to drain it overnight several times when you soak it. That's how the, a lot of the Portuguese do it. But when you get fresh codfish, there's nothing like fresh fish to me. There you go. See the piece and the size that I've got there? The next thing that I do and I enjoy doing this a lot. I love putting the codfish directly on top of the onions and the garlic. So it makes contact with them. All right, next. The scallions aside there for a second. I'm gonna put in some more diced potatoes. I'm just using canned things because it's fast and it's easy. I'm not going to spend the time peeling and dicing potatoes when I can buy them. They're perfectly good in the store. Then I cover the potatoes with another can of tomato sauce. Next, if you like, because I like a lot of onions, I sprinkle the top with scallions. A little bit of pepper along the top of that. Always goes good. Move it to the stove. Put it on medium heat and cover it. One of the things about this food, again, it's the way the food blends that makes it so good. Medium heat, maybe even medium low heat is about all you need. Serving it, same way, simple. Simple bowl, little bowl, a croissant, or Portuguese sweet bread. Well, it's not really garbage soup, it's leftover soup, and uh, my kids used to laugh when I called it garbage soup, but uh, we used to love it, and there are some rules. You don't want to take any bad or old food to put uh, into the soup, never. Only use fresh leftovers that you don't have a lot of to serve a full meal with. Choose a broth of any kind that you want. You can still add tomato sauces and so forth, but I usually like to have beef broth or chicken broth. And there is another rule. What you want to do is you want to cook the uncooked foods separately and add them to the cooked foods later. So you're gonna make a base, basically, of some of the foods, and uh, you're gonna wanna cook the uncooked things before you add those things that were the leftovers that were still good. 
I usually start myself, in fact, I did this one, and every one of these differs. I don't think that these are the same. They're not. It depends on which you ate. Hey, you probably saw me just then catch a tomato that slipped off of the sideboard. Fast hands. That's what musicians are about sometimes. Now, what I'm doing is I'm slicing up the tomatoes, and I'm going to put them into the already uh, seasoned pan. I love to uh, uh, season every one of the pans, and then put in anything that you want, uncooked flavorings of various kinds. I'm using uh, one piece of the Charisse uh, meat that I had used for one of the other recipes, and you can use any kind of a spicy meat uh, in a uh, sausage format that you want. If you like that kind of thing in your soup and you want to add the seasonings from that particular piece of meat. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut up an onion. These are the basis of of the soups. If your kids don't like onions, don't worry about it. Uh, I have some leftover scallions there from the former meal. I'm going to throw that in there too. And um, gee, I had uh, just a few leftover mushrooms. I happen to like mushrooms in soup. What's going to happen is you're going to boil this all down. It's all going to blend together into a very, very nourishing, really, it's kind of a leftover vegetable soup is what it is. But the nicest thing about it is you don't waste food. And people who are very sensitive about their food budgets these days can take smaller portions of foods instead of have them just go bad mix them into a healthy soup that is going to be good for their family and it's very comforting on days like the one we're having here during this production it is thundering and raining like crazy if you hear a little bit of nature sounds in the background that's what it's about all right so this is the uncooked stuff that we've got inside the pan there and we're going to add to that for boiling purposes uh, a box of beef broth I prefer that to water because you would have already cooked some of the nutrients out of uh, some of the vegetables later and this is going to add them a little bit back in and give you a, a nice base for the soup. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what I've done here. I had uh, a stir fry that had snow peas, peppers, broccoli, a little bit of garlic and um, I'm going to use that as the already cooked vegetables and I have two chicken cutlets and I'm going to cut those up. That's right, chicken cutlets. If it's all good food, and just leftovers but not a lot, this will all blend into a beautiful soup where you can pick up the things that you want. You know, if there's a piece of beef in there, well you pull that out if you don't want it, you eat the chicken. Uh, they all blend together because the broth holds them together. What broth? Well, you can either use some tomato sauce, it's up to you. I'm using the leftover broth from the Portuguese chicken roast that I had made earlier because it's so full of beautiful spices and nutrients from the cooking of the chicken with the potatoes and the carrots and more. That's the way that I do it and I blend that all together so everything in this particular pan right now, the fry pan, is actually cooked. The pasta is also cooked, but you're not going to add the pasta or, or cooked rice or anything like that to the soup until it's boiling because you don't want to overcook any further. Now, this is the uh, broth being made and boiled from the uncooked vegetables that are going to break down now. So they kind of equalize themselves with the cooked things. I put in a little bit of salt, a little pepper, and because we like spicy food, I just put in some hot crushed pepper as well and I let it boil at medium heat. Then I add, without cooking, the pan of the already cooked leftovers that were still good. The snow peas and the broccoli, the chicken cutlet, there may even be, yeah, you're not gonna believe it, a little bit of scallop in there too. We had some small scallops that were part of the stir fry. It doesn't affect the soup. By then all the fishy smells gone. Yeah, I put in a can of cream corn. It's going to thicken the soup a little bit and give us some corn in the soup as well. I, I like to use the cream corn more than I do the uh, the uncreamed corn or the whole kernel. Now what I'm doing is I'm going to add one more box of the beef broth. During the time of this production, I actually made this soup and I had so much of it, I had to pass it around to some friends of mine who gobbled it up. I even brought some to a workplace where they ate it before they even went home and never made it home. And it's just a very, very comforting and very nutritious. Again, the key is to cook the uncooked things first 
and to always use the leftovers that are still perfectly fresh there simply wasn't enough of each one to make a full meal out of it and all of us have done that and that's where food waste comes in here you're saving money you're saving the food and you're getting the nutrients as well very very simple use those rules as the basis and, and be sensible you don't want to mix a whole bunch of fish with a whole bunch of beef you want to try to have some kind of a theme whether it's a color theme of a, a green or a red or whatever a pasta theme or a rice theme here I'm putting in pasta that had already been cooked and mixing that up till it kind of loosens again so I'm not really going to overcook it we're going to be turning the heat off here shortly and uh, and then you just serve it it's simple and it's full of nutrients and a lot of the pieces that are in there are big enough that if somebody doesn't like something in particular they can fish them out don't be afraid to try this and experiment occasionally you'll make a bad one but for the most part stick with those rules and you're gonna make a good garbage soup well okay the kids call the it garbage it's a leftover soup and it's a fresh leftover soup that's extremely good